and repetitive control. Um, I, first of all, I think it's better you grab another cup of coffee <laughs> because I have 200 slides to, s to bomb you. <laughs> Young plus a demo. Let's see. But it should be okay, I guess. The lots of slides just show you some pictures. No heavy mass, just um, so relax. So here, um, first of all, I want to acknowledge my um, um, ex-colleagues, friends, and co-inventors in Seagate, Singapore Science Design Center. You can see lots of names. So basically, my boss, actually my bosses here, they don't have a PhD degree. And the second line, all of these guys, they have a PhD degree. And these are uh, co colleagues in my group. And this line, basically, they are managers, uh, managers' bosses. So they call it director. And we have some secret US size um, colleagues. We have lots of communication. So here is the mini plan. Um, I will divide this one in three parts. Uh, until 10.30, I'm going to finish part one to give you an introduction, one and a half hour introduction, how to drive server control. Probably it's boring, but I try to be interesting. Then from uh, 11, uh, from 10.30 to 12, I'm going to cover parsimonious iterative learning control and repetitive control. Um, so that's um, basically my mini plan. So first, I'm going to introduce some background information on disk drives. After that, I'll tell you something about challenges and limits. And I'll tell you the story of uh, our Seagate product U6 and um, a preview of my patents at Seagate. So you know that Disk drive, we use it every day now, and we take it for granted. But if you think twice, you will see that it is such an amazing electronic device. You just plug in, and it will work for you reliably for many, many years. So first introduced by IBM in 1957, the recording density increased by a factor of 10 million if we compare with 1957. <coughs> and I have the data in 1997, which means 40 years later, we have shipped 200 million hard disk drives. Average cost less than 5 cents per megabyte. So that's, so in 1999, the capacity, if we count in terms of bits, then that number will be 10 to the power of 18, <coughs> 1 million terabytes. 1 million terabytes. Therefore, until 2000, I, I remember this ACC 2000, this is uh, ACC 2001, in the control communi community, they feel there is a need to increase the mm, appreciation of the disk drive control. It was such a wonderful control device. So uh, Messner in uh, Carnegie Mellon, and this guy is in Quantum. Uh, yeah, Quantum. Uh, they wrote a tutorial for uh, disk drive control. And you can see in the conference proceedings how many pages of this paper. This is very unusual, it's 13 pages, if I remember correctly, yeah. So it's very unusual conference paper, 13 pages. It's just for tutorial for control of disk drives. So even these days, I can see uh, some special sessions um, on disk drive control. So which means more and more people start to appreciate some wonderful controls within the disk drive. Now I'll tell you, without control, you cannot do anything in disk drive. You cannot achieve the, such a status of disk drive today. So this is a typical disk drive. Um, yeah, I remember. I have um, 
parser run. I disassembled this um, disk drive, if you have a look. But this disk drive is an older version, so it's not that compact. So you have a um, spindle motor. So this is a disk, <coughs> disk spinning around the spin, uh, the, the, by the spindle motor at a constant speed. And this uh, is a disk you store your data on the media of the disk. This one called voice coil motor to move this rewrite head to rotate around this pivot point. And there are red right head in here, okay? So there's only a small range of movement you can do. Okay. So this is a schematic plot block diagram regarding a server loop. Your voice coil motor move, uh, move around this pivot point then you have a server de demodulator through the AD converter. Then you go to a um, server controller. Then you generate a DA converter. Then you control the power amplifier so that you move your voice coil motor so that you can position your rewrite head from one track to another track. And basically, this is the job we need to do to do the server. To do the server. So let me show you um, maybe this one. So it's so it's kind of a animation of the seek process. Let's have a closer look of uh, the read write head. A read write head. And today's technology called giant GMR, called giant magnetoresistive head. <coughs> and this re this sensing principle is is due to the resistance change if your magnetic field changes. So here is the red right head, MR head, the small black one. This guy, this guy. So this one, and here is a shear. This is a shear. Um, here is a gap, here is a gap. Here is the coil, there's a coil. So you can see that read is by this, but write is by this. Right. So read and write, they're using, they use different head, different head. And the slider, the head is mounted on the slider, like here, <laughs> flying over the media. And here there is, um, fly height, the typical fly height now is uh, 20 nanometer. So, uh, and the speed, the spinning speed is about 90 hertz, which means it's a 40, it's a 5400 RPM for the spinning disk. So if you compute the equivalence, you can imagine, this is typically about, uh, it's like a Boeing 747 flying at an altitude of few mi millimeter, few millimeter. So it's a wonderful um, technique here. But uh, you know that the real high tech is not in server. Real high tech is in these materials. So these rewrite head guys in the disk drive company, they are on the top. If they cannot make you a sensitive enough rewrite head, you cannot do anything. Uh, you cannot do anything. Even if you have wonderful control ideas. So these guys set you the baseline of the, your performance. So the sensitivity of the right head. What's happening with our this packet here? You've got a, the head on top. Mm -hmm. What's happening in between? In between is gap. Oh, oh there, are multiple, there are multiple plates. And, but yeah, they have I another head, another head. There I is a. Can't <laughs> Oh, there is another head. It's kind of you kind of this is a read right head. You have multiple disks, yeah. so it's go inside like this. And there is separate servo for each one. I only see one arm. No, only one, one. one. only one, only one control. So then you, the storage is done in some coordinated way. Yeah, coordinated way in a vertical way. So that's so they have physical cylinder or this one called physical cylinder. 
So you put together, you have a logic cylinder. So, so I'm going to introduce you two important um, density concepts. One is called TPI, tracks per inch. One is called BPI, bits per inch. Uh, track per inch, tracks, TPI is uh, easy to understand, which means uh, from the center point, you are spinning your disk, then go outwards, then you have a unit lens, you measure how many tracks you can pack inside. This one, this density called TPI. However, if you run around this circle, around this circle, you can also count the the density, this one called linear density, in terms of how many bits you can pack in one inch, in one inch. So it's um, um, both of them are densities, but uh, different meanings. One is tracks per inch, one is bits per inch. So it's TPI and a BPI. So put together, put together this number, you know that unit square inch, how many bits, how many bits you can pack inside, you can store inside. So this is an important benchmark number. So every year this one is increasing. So, so the area density then will be a megabyte per square inch. I told you that if this one times, this one will be a bit per bits per square inch. So this is called error density. The error density trend uh, is something like that. In 1957, is around here, that is um, pretty low, is, is about two, is about two bytes per square inch. Then until here, this is there. You can see there is this a point where you can speed, you can increase your density significantly. So this is due to the invention of the magnetoresistive head called MR head in the early 90s. Early 90s. And until this point is the first the giant MR head. Uh, MR head. So now this is the current technology using the GMR head, GMR head. So if you compare the density, now it's already five million increase, five million re increase. So within uh, 40 years. How many tracks are there in the disk That depends, that's time varying. <laughs> I know, for very dis every disk drive, this is a fixed. I mean, uh, you should ask which year or which product this one is low. This one is uh, maybe um, 10K. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we can do uh, 100K. I heard, I heard. Uh, yeah, between square and one inch is a uh, track density like this, this one. Uh, yeah, this density. Num number of tracks per inch. Yes, radio direction. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, th this yeah, this is a good point. Actually, we uh, in the disk surface we have um, the, you mean the distribution of the density? Yeah, there is a distribution of the density, but we will take care of this. But what we say is in the average sense, average sense. So if we compare the density trend uh, in the disk storage industri industry, you can see that <coughs> for this one is optical. So the optical one is always under this this line, this under li this line is an um, optical storage error density. And for disk drive, it's like this. Brr, there is an <laughs> increase. Be careful, here is a log, it's a log scale, okay? Uh, this is a um, solid state memory, solid state memory. 
is starting from here, but the density increase will be like this, will be like this. So it's uh, not increasing as fast as disk drive. So don't worry, disk drive will survive, I guess. Because the semiconductor storage is too expensive, I'll show you the cost trend here. Um, for semiconductor, they are also decreasing. This is a semiconductor storage using solid state st uh, storage, uh, flash memory, something like that, for DRAM. <coughs> DRAM. And this is the magnetic hard disk drive. And this cost is called um, paper or using a film. If you buy a film to store or use in paper, the cost is around here. So you can see that now using a um, disk drive, this store information is much cheaper than you use papers and films. Uh, digital camera? No, an answering machine. Uh, answering machine. Yeah, yeah that, that you use this one. Um, probably you answering machine you use um, solid state. Or you'd use tape, probably. Uh, not no, no longer tape. No longer. Then you use um, DRAM. Yeah. But there is a trend that I can predict in the future. I can predict in the future. Every family will have an tens of uh, hard disk drives because th people have kind of spontaneous desire to ask the time to fly back. Say, oh, I want to watch the movie of yesterday, uh, watch the TV of yesterday. Can you, can, you can you ask the TV station to do that for you? No. So the best is possible with disk drive, you have a huge buffer. You have a huge buffer so that you can turn the time back. You can watch the TV of a week ago. That's possible using uh, data compression technology, compression technology, using disk drives. So actually, currently, um, SIGI is targeting uh, on the consumer electronics so that they put many disk drives into uh, integrated with the TV so that you can turn your time back. So that's possible. That's possible. Okay, in terms of the capacity shift from uh, this uh, the data collection from uh, uh, 90 to 2000, see you can see there is a steady state, a kind of very linear increase here. So bytes shift per year um, until um, year 2002 is around 10 to the power of 19. <coughs> 10 to the power of 19. This is a really big number. Okay, so I guess the trend will be correct. Will be correct. And uh, in terms of terabytes. So you can see that the cost decreases 100% yearly or must, and your shift capacity increased also 100% yearly, then the revenue for the industry actually is flat, or even decreasing. <laughs> Therefore, in this drive company, they are very, very cost conscious. So if you have something really good, you should not incur any increase of, um, of the cost. <coughs> so the control the advanced control will have a big role here. They only change the CFZ <laughs> or CFS, then give you some additional benefits. Then they will like it. The only software will change. So, so y in the management level, they believe that it's not that important for technological innovation. They believe lean manufacturing will, will bring in the money, <coughs> not due to the technology innovation. So the, the emphasis, actually, they put more on the manufacturing management, like total quality control. Uh, probably you know that TQC, total quality control, is no longer popular. They use another word called Six Sigma. <laughs> then, so in Seagate, <coughs> they train every senior engineering and above to get a certificate for Six Sigma Green Belt. 
and they need the all of them including me need to uh, spend 80 hours in five star hotels actually i forgot to put s here because they keep changing the hotel then try to experience all the five star hotels in singapore so 80 hours is very very intensive right um, i didn't learn something about six sigma i think our control people should also learn something about six sigma so in the future, you present your data, it's no longer a number. <laughs> yeah, you should use um, mean and variance using those bar, uh, the, the, the bar charts, those things to communicate with the management level. All right? So the, manage the management level, they only know the Six Sigma terminologies. So, so now I'm going to introduce some challenges and limits due, um, due to the density, due to high TPI. When your TPI is very high, tracks per inch, then what are the challenges and the limits? So let's review this picture again. So what I'm going to impress you here is there is a ratio called bit aspect ratio, called BPI versus TPI. And the linear density, there is a fundamental limitation due to the super paramagnetic effect. So which means there is a limit. So it's, there is the smallest allowable magnetic grain and in the media. If you are bigger than this one, you cannot do the job. So if the grain is smaller than the critic size in diameter, random, uh, is too small, then some random thermal effect will cause the grains to demagnetize in tens of nanoseconds. So in that case, if it is the grain is too small, your disk drive will be <laughs> volatile, which means the end of the day, you turn off your computer, then turn on again, your all of your information disappeared. So it's no longer non-volatile for tens of years. So you cannot uh, increase the BPI. There is a limit for that due to this uh, super paramagnetic effect. So if you increase TPI or track density, is more preferred from material science point of view. Okay. So now everyone is trying to uh, do the high TPI solution to pack more tracks into the unit uh, inch. So. The high capacity of hard disk drive towards one dollar per gigabyte is no longer a dream. I think it's close. It's very close. Probably now it's two dollars per gigabyte, right? I I remember probably. <laughs> so here you can uh, uh, this is um, TPI TPI problem. You so it's better to put a radio density high instead of um, increase the BPI, the linear density. If we put the linear density high, you have the problem, as I indicated. But from another point of view of cost, if you increase the BPI, you have to use very advanced material, or uh, use some material. You need complicated pre-processing, material processing processes. So that will be cost you a lot. So anyway, what I want to say here is TPI it's the way to go, not BPI. BPI is already at its limit. Okay, you don't want to increase the BPI to a point that your reliability <laughs> of the disk drive, after four years, your disk drive data disappeared automatically. So you don't want to do that. Due to the m intrinsic material constraint, you have to go to TPI, increase the TPI. However, if you increase the TPI until to a point you will mess up two adjacent tracks. Suppose I have a track 9, I have a track 10, so you have some data written in. Um, you can see that due to the error, if you, uh, due to the error or in the track following, you may have um, this one called TMR, called track misregistration. Track misregistration uh, is, uh, which means you cannot distinguish these two tracks or you write on one track, you erase the data of another track. That one, of course, you don't want it. 
So this is the consequence of the high TPI. So we want we want the truck error to be smaller. So this this black band will be smaller than uh, if this black band is smaller, then I don't have this problem here. Okay. So so that is the challenge for our control people. So I, I want to conclude that if you increasing increase the BPI, then actually you are challenging head and media engineers. If you increase TPI, you are challenging <coughs> server and the mechanical engineers. So for the server server engineers, the two tasks to do, one is to seek accurately, one is track follow accurately. Okay. So the key issues here is the head accuracy of the track following. Usually it's defined as 10% of the track pitch. 10% of the track pitch. Track pitch means the distance between two adjacent tracks for good TMR budget. Because there are many factors to contribute to this TMR, so we need this so read write is only uh, part of it. So there are some other reasons. So you need leave enough budget <laughs> for this TMR. And you, uh, you want to seek as fast as possible um, with less excited noise for performance index. So let me um, look at this one again. So this is um, voice coin motor, track following. And this is server loop. You have a um, server demodulator, AD and converter, C and server controller, and DA and power amplifier. The error, the track, the track following error, if you do the spectrum analysis, is is pretty ugly. It's pretty ugly. So you can see this is a frequency, this is a spectrum energy. So the PS PS stands for position error. It's the only information you can sense in the disk drive. <laughs> the error, you can see that there are many spikes. And there are some baseline shape like this. Baseline shape like this. So there are many interpretations. Some good engineers, they can tell which, which spike corresponding to what kind of mechanical reason. Or due to some, some like the baseline, ma mainly is due to the noise in the modulation, uh, demodulation process of the PIPES. So I'm going to explain this uh, modulation, demodulation more later. And they say that here is another one is due to the air turbulence uh, inside disk drive. So there are many um, uh, classifications of the errors. But uh, you can see that the energy mainly contributed by uh, spindle run out, spindle run out and uh, the disk vibrations. So we are going to, yeah, I'm going to <laughs> spin around out. So this one is, um, these two terms, NRO and RO, are very common um, terminologies in disk drive server. And sometimes they call this is um, Non-synchronous position error. I'm going to show you on the, on the, on the in a moment in the scope about uh, synchronized and non-synchronized errors. So repeatable run out, which means um, it is repeatable synchronized to the server in server index. So every time you rotate, it is um, the same. So if we do uh, many uh, many. Uh, uh, traces put together, there is a fixed shape. And this um, fixed shape is called, this fixed shape is called a repeat of run out. This uh, black kind of um, error, uh, kind of like a residue, this one is NRO, non repeat of run out. So in this case, we don't have a big repeat of run out. But in this case, you have, you have fixed shape here. This one is repeatable run out. So the learning control is perfect for this repeatable run out. So where we are. So the sources of error, 
non-repeatable runouts is PES generation uh, noise and modulation and demodulation noise and disk vibration and actuator arm vibration. So you have a positioning of your arm, you have some high frequency modes. So and disk enclosure vibration, that is the box. Uh, air turbulence inside. So it's we call this is due to the windage. For the repeatable runouts is there are two reasons. One is uh, due to the synchronized vibration, like spin the motor imperfection. So it's due to the spin the motor. Your motor is, you have ball bearing, you have something inside. You always have some vibration. But this type of vibration is synchronized. So redu uh, induce the synchronized repeatable runouts for the rate right ahead. Rate right ahead. Uh, is maybe it's due to the uh, eccentricity of the spindle drive. That's uh, one reason, but... Um, uh, yeah, that uh, also contribute, also contribute to the RRO, um, and same time contribute in RRO, yeah. And recently, due to the track density is um, very, very high, so there is a server track writer error called formatting error, it's non-circular eccentric tracks. So mainly today I'm going to talk about this, talk about this, due to the STW, so called server track writer. So what is server track writer? I'm going to explain why there is a need for this. I'm going to explain this one to you soon. So also, if you switch from seek to settling, you have arrival errors, you have resonance, bias force errors, due to frictions, and so on. So these are all the sources of errors. Um, OK, so for high TPI server control challenges, you want to optimize the server and the mechanics to minimize the effect of these errors. There are two ways to go. <coughs> you can push high loop bandwidth. High loop bandwidth means high gain control. <laughs> you put your gain as high as possible so that your sensitivity will go. <coughs> so your sensitivity, this is a low, low gain. This is S. So this is a high, this is a low. So you can see if we put a low, you have lots of um, attenuation here. So you want to do that. But this one will excite, excite your high frequency portion due to the water better effect. I exactly experienced this one, I measured this, compared this. So high gain is not practical. And if you want to achieve high gain without pay a lot here, then you have to use very good mechanics. Okay. Another way is um, is to use a dual stage server, but that one will increase a lot for your disk drive cost. So How would you do that? dual stage, which means I'm actually it's not my uh, focus today. You have a row right ahead, then you put another one and do the fine tuning. So actually you have two inputs to do the positioning. So it's a two input, one output. So you have more control authority. So you can do better. Yeah, this is conceptually true, but it's very hard to do, very hard. I know, I played a little bit about this, but they, are, they, they decided to throw out this one for the uh, desktop PC, they don't want to use it. They cannot, um, they cannot pay the <coughs> cost. So only in a very high-end drive, like military use, like very large database use, the dis and those kind of serv file server, they use dual stage now, okay. But it's very expensive, I know that. Do, do you want to pay 20K to buy a disk drive? 
<laughs> okay. It, for high-end drive, they can be as expensive as 20K per drive. So <coughs> we're talking about desktop drive. What do you get for that price? Yeah, that price is uh, your latency of your files seek, your, your s rewrite, and the time is very, very small, just maybe one millisecond. Yeah, now it's on, in a desktop is 10 milliseconds. Oh, from server and uh, mechanic point of view, there is no difference. Only the interface change. Oh. Yeah, like the drive, you can configure as a SCSI, as you you can also configure as an uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, EID. Oh, EID. Okay, ID. <laughs> EID. Okay, uh, I know ID. I forgot <laughs> EID. Um, that's uh, that's standard. You just follow the definition. You can oh. do the job. Same, same. <coughs> <coughs> so basically, you have an impression that. Well let me summarize. If you do, a, if you put more uh, more tracks, then you need to good, do a good job for server control. You have an impression. So let me tell you some story about Seagate U6. And here is an. Uh, some quotes from uh, the website. There are some dedicated labs to test all different types of drives and write a review. So they publish the reviews. And so everyone is serious about this. It's like a university is so serious about the US news ranking. <laughs> they put different index, um, uh, the different performance metrics to compare. So they write conclusive description. Say this is a new submarine from a Seagate. Um, it's today's Hera. Uh, it's the first one, uh, the highest capacity available today. It's 40 gig per plat. If you put a one or two platters, you can achieve 80 gig bytes. So if you, if you buy an 80 gig disk drive from Seagate, and it brown is a U6 auto, U means ultra, ultra series six. Then that disk drive will run maybe three to four patterns I contributed inside. So I can proudly to announce I have um, control algorithms running in millions of drives, uh, 80 gig drives, yeah. But I don't know, how about the current situation? Um, okay, uh, okay, I, yeah, it's, we are the number one to include the AM into the disk drive for automatic acoustic management. So think about in a commercial, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, <coughs> consumer electronics market, you want to buffer your radio, FM radio in your bedroom. <laughs> you don't want your disk drive to be um, loud, noisy, right? Yeah. So you want a tuning knob to turn it low profile a little bit, less noisy, but it can maybe slower to do the job slower. Okay. So it can be aggressive, very noisy, but can do the job very quick. Do the sick and track following and uh, do the sick very very fast. So we need a tuning knob. We invented this tuning knob and opened this one to customers. So the next question is we need to propose a industry standard to this type of in uh, feature. So in the future if you find your uh, PC is too noisy, too noisy, you can turn something down, then it, it's not that noisy, but the disk drive may be slower. You feel that you copy a file a little bit slower, something like that. But now you, it's not a standard yet. It's still trying to set up the standard. And there are big market. There is there is a big market for this, especially for consumer electronics. So 
there is one guy, uh, one company tried to sue Seagate about this patent. Actually, in the year 2000, 2001, I got a subpoena for <laughs> for this patent litigation. <laughs> so it's very interesting. So everyone is fighting for the, to be the first to to have some new features. So uh -huh, U.S. here. Yeah. <laughs> the videotape, all the stuff. They pay me, of course, one hundred dollars per hour. <laughs> they spend me maybe ten hours or something. It's bad, not bad. Yeah, one more. I hope they can go. <laughs> <coughs> uh, better not. So, SIG engineers managed to squeeze high performance out of the 40 gig platters without increasing the uh, prices dramatically. So, this one basically they are they are saying iterative learning control and did the job, did the job, yeah. So, let me give you a sense of the density measure. So, in this paper, 2001, Messner and uh, this uh, quant quantum guy gave a tutorial, they said that the current highest track density is about 1,500 tracks per millimeter. It's about 38K TPI tracks per inch. I can convert this millimeter to inch, okay? So that's 2001. What we did at the same time, um, no, not same time, in 2000, 2000, because I left the Seagate 2000, so in 2000, our TPI is already 58K TPI, okay? And the BPI for the highest BPI achieved by, um, surveyed by Messner, it says this K BPI. By we, we, of course, we are clearly bigger than this, but I cannot give you an exact number, it's a secret. If I give you this number, you can compute the error density. That's considered as commercial secret. So I don't want to give you this number. I just tell you it's greater than this. Um, <coughs> so you can use in the TPI to, to compute the track pitch. I did some ma mass here. It's a one inch. Then you have this many number of tracks. So the, the distance between two tracks is about less than almost 500 nanometers. However, you want to achieve the tracking accuracy about plus or minus 10%, then you can conclude that your position error has to be less than plus or minus 50 nanometers. So everyone is talking about nano positioning. We did this one in 2000 already. So I keep telling people we are doing a nano positioning. So after the mass, they, they, they are convinced that we did. So but there is something very important to know in disk drives, there is no conventional position sensor, no velocity sensor, no acceleration sensor. They can achieve plus or minus 50 nanometer. Think about this. It's a magic. So I'm going to explain, try my best to explain how they did it. So the, oh, sorry. So the secret is here. They embedded the several patterns on the media so that when you're Rewrite right head, fly over different tracks, they will have different patterns of, of the embedded pattern of the server. So this one is called embedded server concept. So which means your rewrite right head can be a, a position sensor simultaneously, or by the way it can be. So, um, so this uh, asks um, the requirement for you need to pre-format this media to write many, many tracks, and each track has a different pattern, okay? So that when you fly over this pattern, uh, this track, you have this pattern, then you, you can decode, demodulate, and get this position error, uh, position error information. So in, in fact, in this drive, they do in this way. They, they divide this in tracks in a radio direction, and also, they put this one in uh, different sectors, different sectors. Actually, each sector corresponding to a sampling period. 
uh, sampling period. So for our U6 server sectors, we use 2.8a and spin the uh, rotational speed is uh, 5400 RPM, it's corresponding to 90 hertz. So you turn one, um, <coughs> The turn one turn is one over ninety or uh, one over ninety second, and while you have this many sectors, so put together your sampling frequency is twenty six k, twenty six k. So you can see the sampling frequency is twenty six k. So I'm going to show you the bandwidth later about the bandwidth of the system. So I think this is the highest bandwidth I can see in the motion control. Because in the motion control, if you have two hertz, if you have 10 hertz, you will be proud of it. Wow, it's very fast. But our bandwidth will be in more than 80 hertz, 800 hertz. Think about it, how fast it should be. So here uh, today, OK, uh, here are some stories. Today I'm going to introduce two of my patterns. Uh, related to iterative learning control, but actually I submitted 16 disclosures or evaluated by a um, patent review committee. And I worked in SIGID from 1999, March to 2000, September. Now currently I got three granted and nine pending, which means they got published. You can download all the full image from this site. Uh, using my last uh, first name to search is easier, so you can you can get all the. Uh, <coughs> but you may ask, three plus nine is no longer sixteen. Uh, I don't know the reason, but some some of them may be still under processing, or some fighting. I don't know. Um, but according to this website, I got three plus nine. And uh, I heard that they are trying to merge some of the patterns to save the IP cost, intele intellectual pro property cost. So probably I have some uh, some patterns got merged, merged, so they have a broader protection. And um, all of them are implemented on the actual hard disk drives in assembly language using Siemens C166. It's a 16 bits fixed point uh, in, this, uh, in the Singapore Science Park Design Center. And some of them are used in products in uh, early products as uh, U8, U10. The latest one I worked is U6, it's a 4080 gig. Why I put a slash here? It's because you can put one platter or two platters inside. Like uh, you said, the one you just saw is multiple platters. Okay, you can do it that way. And some taking as trade secret or technological inventory, which means uh, yeah, your technology, uh, this guy, this uh, this method is useful, but we are good enough already. <laughs> Sorry, we don't want or we don't want better. Let's leave this one for next generation of the product. So they call this the inventory of technology. Yeah, technology inventory. I I I did receive some dollars from U.S. and um, from my patents. But um, they stopped paying me <laughs> in, in 2001. But they changed the rule, changed the game. <coughs> uh, I didn't put a number. X, Y, Z does not mean I can get nine digits. <laughs> but, but if I put X, Y, Z, you will see I only, I only got several hundred. No, it's around 10,000. It's around 10,000. So I was dreaming that if I can live another 100 years, I will be a millionaire. But uh, ten <laughs> they stopped in the next year. So. so here I want to share with you something here. You know some sense in our design center. For I, I, I list frequently heard dialogues in, in this design center. So my boss in the morning usually uh, salute <laughs> me is like better, <laughs> not high, <laughs> not like uh, morning. No, he, he said better. <laughs> 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 so I say hi. And if you say, oh yeah, I got something better, you can see. 
and I said, you're asking, what's the price? What's the price to pay? So do we need to add something more, or need more memory, or something, computation the cost, and need to ask? Yeah, if, you, if it's not big price, then say, oh, interesting, then show me on the scope. I don't want to see any simulation result. <laughs> so, and then show me before and after. And if this is even interesting, uh, he, he will walk through it. He will say, I'll walk through the code. I want to walk through the code with you. They say where the code is got messy by your, your, this portion of algorithms. Is it? So it's how, how difficult, it, he will think about how difficult to integrate in the product. So yeah, if everything is good, say, OK, summarize up. Let's send to the database. We have a, a technical report database. Oh, by the way, I <coughs> documented about more than 50. I cannot remember the number. I guess it's 55, maybe. 55 such, such kind of rep technical report in database. So uh, yeah, it's a good solution. It's a right pattern disclosure now. <coughs> Sometimes they decline my, <coughs> my proposal. <coughs> Excuse me. Like I, I propose to use vi variable structure. VSC to do the seek. They say, sorry, you cannot do that. We need a poor man's solution. Your control scheme is um, good, but it's um, too luxurious. So you think about this. You have, a, you have um, 26K sampling frequency. Then in the sampling period, it's only about 38 microseconds. Within this sampling period, you need to do lots of lots of things. Let me tell you, it's not like just doing control. Control is only portion of it, maybe just 10% of it. There are many, many time slots need to be used for uh, retry, for safeguard, for monitoring, for reporting the abnormal phenomenon, um, something like that. It's a control in, in real product. The control curve is less than 10%. <laughs> Many of them are for other purposes. Okay. And usually, it will remind me to double check the gain marking, face marking. And you don't e expect to use uh, any user's manual. If you want to learn, you want to read the code. So I usually read the code until 2 o'clock in the morning. So when I figure out something, I feel very happy. <laughs> so everything is in the code. <laughs> this is their said. The code is the menu. So, so it's really hard at the beginning. If you don't sp invest time to go through the code, know where you put your controller, where, how to, how to put in your ideas, it's very hard. Um, so finally, if you find a way to integrate your ideas, you can use many ideas. So that's why I, I did lots of work because I know the code. I s I invested time to to know the code. So. so today I'm going to talk about scheduled parameter zero acceleration pass pattern. And I'm going to talk about parsimonious repetitive learning compensator. So this one, this talk is based on these two patterns. You may wonder why we propose two patterns. There are some polit political reasons but they are mainly due to the uh, due to the technical reason, because uh, one is purely time domain, one is based on frequency domain. So, um, but I'm sure introducing iterative learning control in disk drive industry uh, for the routine error compensation is first time in Seagate Science Park, the Singapore Science Park Center. So. So basic idea is to make the tracks more straight, more straight, not perfect straight, more straight to improve the TMR budget. Remember what's TMR? Track misregistration. And in turn, you can increase the TPI. So you can squeeze more tracks safely. OK, more tracks safely. So I put safely here is because Sometimes, even if you say, OK, 58 K uh, TPI is already good enough, OK, good enough is good enough. 
you don't want to be better, you still want. If you use this technology, you can increase your reliability, your margin. You can increase your reliability. So it's still attractive, even you don't want to put most trucks in, in, the, in, the, in, in the unit. Uh, yeah, I want to use straight. I tell you the reason. <laughs> uh, okay, there is a reason to use straight. Yes, you can use a circular, but if you really want to be a perfect circular, you have some other trouble. Some other, other trouble. They call track squeeze. Track squeeze. Actually, I can show you on the experimental results. Here, um, for this. Um, a PRLC, I'm trying to attack the spindle-induced multi-harmonics. This is the um, area Professor Longman has the most experience <laughs> about learn, uh, repetitive control. But today, I'm going to share with you, probably many of you first time heard of it. And there is a problem intrinsic for repetitive control in real applications. So it's called frequency drift problem. So basically, I'll tell you why it's important, how, and illustrate some uh, drive level results. So we have a half hour left. So probably I spend 10 minutes to quickly go through and give a quick tour about what are the several basics. I think it's very easy to, to follow. And it doesn't matter if you read, it's very, very easy to to, to understand. And I will leave um, 10 to 20 minutes to Kevin. So Kevin has something to say about the uh, t discussion about general framework, about iterative learning control. Then we'll have a break. Then I come back and explain the iterative learning control in disk drive and show you some demos. Now after that, I explain you um, PRLC. I'm going to impress you that why the frequency drift is important, and it's inevitable, and uh, why that one was ignored by in the literature, um, and show you some real, real, uh, real results, so that in practice you can take care of this drift problem. So. Now I'm planning to give a give you a quick tour to the disk drive. <laughs> that actually, this let me check the slide number. Now it's 31. I have another 70 slides about this. Let's go through the 70 slides within uh, in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's mission possible. But if was all of you are good control people, so it's mission possible. So it's a digital digital control. You have limited control authority. You want a, s a fast response. You have sampling frequency limitation because you don't have a superpower CPU. You have unmodeled dynamics, ex external disturbance. And this is the assembly. Uh, drive closure, spin the motor assembly. You have actua actuator assembly, disks, um, uh, electronic cars. You can see that, actually. Let me see, oh, what's more? Server electronics, drive electronics. Uh, okay. So basically, you can see, thi this is a more detailed block diagram of uh, control. Oh, there's so many details, okay. I don't want to go through these details. So you want to control the spindle drive to maintain the spin speed at a constant speed, okay. Then you want to control the rear right hand. So there are there are several loops. The servo loop is one of the two loops. Another one is called a spindle loop. So it's a spindle control. Also, the spindle control you want to be um, uh, kind of synchronized, taken care of by the same DSP. So the factors affecting disk drive performance is access time, um, transfer rate, um, there are there are a matrix of performance I don't want to go through. L why not let me go through some real stuff, maybe really useful for you. You know that in the disk drive industry and the correction is uh, not was another problem. Previously, 
when the density is high, uh, is low. When density is high, why it is important? Uh, this transducer, I don't want to go through this. Oh, let me mention this one. So the rewrite, uh, the re uh, everything is based on the detection of the position. I told you you can get a PES signal, um, position error signal. But the position error signal is due to the quadrature, using the quadrature concept to so increase the uh, resolution. So you can see you have an A, B, and A, B, C, D. The pattern is like that. If you have, um, if your rewrite head fly over the track, you have this kind of different patterns. Then different patterns, they have different zones. So they use this information to go through the server demodulation chip. Then you can finally get out this uh, quadrature pattern using the commutation. Finally, you can synthesize the cross track in between tracks. What's the error? What's the error? And this is no longer perfect sinusoidal. So there is a serious issue about nonlinearities in the sensor. How to correct it? How to do the linearization? I was involved in this problem. We have filed a pattern on this. Actually, I wanted to call this is an iterative learning process. But finally, they decided to use RMS. <laughs> but anyway, there, is, there are iterations inside. Yeah. And it's online. Online iteration to correct the nonlinearity. So, OK, modeling, everyone knows what's happening. You can see we do the physical modeling, then we do the dimension from uh, input is your, ampli your ampere until something, until finally you have a track. Then finally, you can see it's nothing but a double integrator. OK? It's double integrator. Power amplifier, plant modeling. Again, this is a double, a double integrator. Um, BIOS force. Yeah, there is a BIOS force in, uh, in, the, in the plant. So you have to integrate this BIOS force. It's a constant. Mm. Uh, discretization, PID control, everyone knows. So here is nothing but a double integrator. But you discretize it, you have a state space representation. And also we can do a track for, uh, do the state, state space design based on the observer. So this is the book diagram of the state, everyone knows. So everyone, a prediction. <coughs> During the server interrupt, we update the estimator, then send to the duck. OK, let me show you some real stuff. Here is the plan out, um, output versus input. So this is um, so this is a 180, so it's a double integrator. So this is a double integrator. Until here, then you have some high frequency modes, high frequency modes. So you can safely, here is the phase of minus 180, so it's this is an open loop, open loop body plot. So we measured it using uh, HP and DSA, <coughs> dynamic signal um, analyzer. So this is my controller frequency. So basically, you can see that all the controller has some uh, has something in common, which means all the plants, physical plants, has something in common. This is a physical plant. I showed you just a moment ago. It's double integrated. Everything physically in common is what? They will have face lag. The face will lag. So what's in common in controller? <coughs> you want face lead. So this is the controller, actually. So you have face lead in some frequencies. So overall, you can see the overall, you can see, OK. So, so overall, this is. Um, um, with control, open loop response of the control, with control is uh, one is P times C. It's a controller uh, ver, uh, and plant put together. Open loop is like this. So you have phase marking in here. You have crossover. So you can see gain crossover is around 800 hertz. This point, 800 hertz. Okay, and phase marking is about 40 something degree, 40, sorry, four zero. So the magic number in industry, they believe 60 
degree of face marking will be perfect. So I want to mention that if you have a transducer nonlinearity, this corresponds to you have a body plot condense, condense up and down. <laughs> so which means your gain crossover is changing. Gain crossover is changing in a, in a, in a small interval. Then which means your face marking will also change. Okay, will also change. But if you can align the maximum phase mar a maximum phase response mm. here to your gain crossover, then we should say that is the robust situation. <coughs> okay, this is the magic plot. Uh, this is the, the magic plot that we need to check for every drive. So this is a s sensitivity function. This is a zero dB. So you can see in some frequencies is attenuation. In some frequencies, range is amplification. Okay, so you you should know this amplification here. So, so the the closed loop bandwidth. Let me check. Is about here is one, two, three, four. No. So it's about 400 hertz. Below 400 hertz is an um, attenuation. Above, in between here until 2k, is about is amplification. So. So you need to be careful. Here is a 5 dB. If you want to attenuate something, you will amplify something. And this is an uh, experimental data, actual data. So they call ETF, error transfer function. That is a complement, uh, that is a sensitivity function S in our sense here. Sick loop, wow. Well, Sick loop, there are not many things to do. It's basically based on the optimal control theory. Uh, you want the bump bump control in, in, in a limit, but you cannot do that, so you do some modification. Um, this is actual seek. So for short seek and, and long seek, they should be different. Uh huh, I guess. This one is keep, um, resetting internally, I guess. Um, let me find a way to turn this one. Turn this one off. Okay. And then wait. Da, 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 recover then. Turn it on. So the seek basically they use model based seek to try to minimize minimize model based the seek which means you, you like in a in a, in a robot control you use computed talk here is similar use computed talk as your feed forward so that you can do a good job so it's model based seek is model based but track following is very hard you need to dance with the noises <laughs> so you need to you need to play with the sensitivity peaks here Oh no! You, there are there there are no feedback controllers. Yeah. Uh, let me see. For long, this is uh, for long seek. The, there are something called PTOS, called approximate time optimal control server mechanisms. We already implemented in disk drive. And this is the diagram of PTOS. So here is oh here here is the one here is the one you asked about sine function versus saturation function. Here is the replacement using a saturation function instead of using sine function to achieve approximate um, time optimal One extend. I have extension cord here. And
five minutes. I only need five minutes. Let me go to. Let me share with you uh, my um, experience with uh, friction characterization. Because I, my first grounded pattern was in uh, friction. If you measure the body, and in a very low frequency portion, you will see different behavior if you put different excitation. Okay. And this friction, you will have trouble when you uh, do the settling. Is and um, friction will not allow you settle PS properly. So the customer, what customer will see, is the sick lens versus sick time. If you measure many many times, they are not consistent. Consistent. So the behavior will be like this. Behavior will be like this, but if you have you, you don't have a um, significant friction problem, your sick versus sick lens will be very consistent. Okay, so there are lots of commercial implications of this inconsistency. So all, of course, all the testing labs they will use your worst case performance to report. So you you damage your performance and, and product challenge. <coughs> So the bias force is the, is the major source I can compensate this friction. Um, if I measure again uh, in using different using different excitation level, I got different behavior for body in the body plot, in the body plot. And in the time domain, if I seek forward, here the ODID means uh, uh, outward. Out, outward diameter and inward diameter called is um, you go from outward diameter from out to inner, inner to out. If you seek differently, your bias force is different. So that's not surprising. Is we know that. So this idea can be used to measure friction. I actually I asked one of my students to try on the DC motor. You should be able to see this behavior. So if you seek the direction differently. However, if we look, have a closer look, if we only uh, do a, a seek in the small range, I can see some hysteresis loop. So the friction is more complicated behavior than we imagine. Okay. So here are something. So if I uh, put together, so I, I was seek. In last picture, I seek in this small range. I have this loop. So this is the whole disk drive. Uh, then, if I increase the increase the, the sick lens in this bigger region, I have this loop. Again, I think this the observation is very interesting. So I put together the big and the small and behave like this. And we can use this um, bias force to infer something wrong. I guess something wrong with the um, lubri lubricant here. Uh, this is a bias force versus the sick lens away from the fixed target. Uh, this is the this is the fixed target. I seek this way. I seek that way. So I can see this is actually my um, position. So versus position, the friction uh, frequency. A uh, friction will behave like this. <coughs> so uh, there are friction models like this. Uh, let me skip the dual stage actuator. Um, you actually you can do the model based compensation of friction, but let me give you a final remark. In all disk drive industry, they never attacked in this way, <laughs> and they don't believe this is a significant issue right now. So they don't, don't do this. So friction compensation is not used in disk, at least in Seagate disks. So because it is not significant. So 
if you propose to do this. So that's why I didn't do anything uh, compensating about it. So because this is not significant. Dual stage I want to skip, vibration. So basically, you want the high TPI, you want high bandwidth, you want higher sampling rate, you need faster CPU, you need also complicated server control. So in the, the in, in server technology for future, th these are the challenges. Reduce tracking error. You want to reduce shock and vibra vibration rejection. Uh, actuators resonance elimination. Reduce the sick induced acoustics. Improve access time. And simplify the control algorithms. <laughs> Don't increase the control complexity. Try to reduce try to use simple control algorithms. So that's um, all I have for the morning. Uh, I skipped many uh, slides, but uh, you can read the electronics online. And um, actually, I was thinking about to set up a uh, course on server engineering so that um, the student could get some experience to the storage industry. This can be uh, useful for DVD and uh, industry and DVD server or CD ROM server describe so they have some many things in common. So I leave ten minutes, maybe not. Yeah, to Kevin. You were mentioning about his thinking in a unified framework. I can do that. L let me adjust this. Now I'll put something under here. Let me do this. Now then you can't, you won't do it. It won't go down. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay, I guess this is okay. Yeah, that's optimal. It's <laughs> non-linear. Okay, uh, let's start. So you can see I used a very strange word here called parsimonious. So I guess um, I will be used this word <laughs> for learning field for the control. I saw they have uh, a publication about the parsimonious learning field for the control. So I want to borrow this word, put it in front of repetitive control and iterative learning control. The reason I want to use is some political reason, because if I put this word in front of iterative learning control, the management will be happier. So <laughs> they tend to believe that, oh, yeah, this is doable. <laughs> so <laughs> it's um, political reason plus some um, technological reason. I'm going to show you why uh, this parsimonious um, scheme is important. And let me, s let me start from uh, why we need to use this one in, IOS, uh, in disk drive. Actually, I explained that we have some, some peaks here, some dirty spectrum, very, very dirty, ugly. So we want to compensate this one, to massage it, to do um, a compensation. So basically, we work on the p position error signal. Um, and you can see the RRO and NRRO, they have a fixed shape. This is a RRO. So what if I can put a compensation to pull this guy down? That will be nice. So here is an illustration. Um, I told you that the tracks is pre-written by server track writer, uh, also known as a formatting progress, containing the server bursts. And a different track has a different burst. 
pattern so that when the rear right head fly over the track, specific track, they know what's the track number. And also, they have server index, and they know which sector they are. So put together, they know where they are. So they solve this position sensing problem. Okay. And when you do this pre-writing, uh, pre-writing the tracks, and um, it also is, is, is done by another control system to write, to write the circle, but it's not circular. It's not circular. So the motivation is, can we make this one more circular? Okay, more circular. So I use this um, uh, more straight. That is because suppose you sitting, you are sitting on a head, you are moving in this way. So what you see is always a straight line. <laughs> it's always a straight line if you sit on the red right head. So, so it, you will see a straight line zigzag like this. So if it's perfectly circular, then this one will be straight, constant. We call zero acceleration pulse. So which is a perfectly circular. Um, so what if you can have um, some compensation to correct these zigzags? So it will be much better. So the track density can be uh, increased. If uh, it is exact li zigzag like this, then track density is limited. Uh, it's definitely limited. Oh, you mean spiral? Yeah. No, it's separated. It's separated. Yeah, it's uh, uh, concentric circles. Right, so there are some edges between. No, no. What? It's, it's written with a. It's supposedly, supposedly written with a certain radius. Uh huh. But the radius isn't perfect. Yeah, but the, between the tracks, is there a physical uh, separation? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah. You have to make this one called track pitch. Yeah. Right. Track pitch. Yeah. Yeah, that one you you can increase your density, increase your density. You put another track in between the tracks, but uh, due to the zigzag nature. I mean, I mean the material itself. Is it yes, material itself is physically separated. It, it is. It's just a plane, isn't it? It's homogeneous material. Oh, it's a homogeneous material. It's all the way magnetic surface. Right. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. It's not like you put the magnet uh, materials like in a separated. No, it's not like that. N n they never did it in this way. <laughs> yeah, ne it's a homogeneous surface. Yes. When, uh, why you say? Why you? Because it's just learning that you start a reset, uh, or just keep going and. No, this is an offline scheme. I'm going to explain. It's an offline scheme. It's um, you build. How do the question is how to build a table. How to build the table? I'm not going to compensate this one in real time and learn this table in real time. No, I'm not going to do that. And this actually is not allowed in and product. You have to draw these circles. You don't have to draw these circles mm -hmm. and store information. Uh -huh. you can do yes, in your heart. you will embed that information s on the server, uh, in on the media. You embed this uh, in the disk um, burst. And uh, each circle you have a burst. Each track you have a burst. <laughs> The burst will have a specific pattern to indicate which which track number this track is. Then we put this embed this information into this server burst. Of course, this you will occupy a, sl a slice of that uh, physical magnet surface. But um, of course, uh, you need to use that one. You, you cannot compensate from nothing. Yeah, you need to use memory. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so what, what is the scheme I'm going to use is to learn this compensation table. And um, so I promoted this new framework in Seagate, so uh, we can use this iterative learning control. Actually, that was my old belief. I think everything which is deterministic, that can be extracted from observations. So I did something called curve identification using optimal control program to extract aerodynamic curves from a radar measured data, <laughs> then I think the idea is similar here. Can we use PS 
uh, position error measurements to extract to extract the information from here? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. So I say I can. Uh, the compensation concept is a fit for all technique. If you have the table, you can just add in then and think the compensation is done. So how to learn this one? We, we can use the idea of iteration. So that's why iterative learning control. And using current effort is your previous efforts plus some corrections. So you keep iteration, then you will get this uh, compensation table. But actually, in, in Seagate, there are some existing schemes that try to solve the same problem. But they never thought of an um, iteration. So how I convince them the iteration is important? Um, because we have this uh, server loop. We have uh, this controller plant. We have a written uh, position disturbance like this. The zigzag is from here. I want to compensate, put a table in here. So the basically, you can only measure PES, and your plan is also uncertain. So you, from this one, it seems you can, seems you can do this one if you know P and C exactly. But you do, you have uncertainties in your plans. So that's why we need iteration. So another way to look at iterative learning control probably is due to the uncertainty in your plan model. So you use iteration to pay for the uncertainty. So here is uncertainty in the body plots. If I have uh, three body plots at the three temperature, uh, three different temperatures, you will have, you can see some differences here. Okay, some differences. Here. So I just want to show you the P of S is uncertain. The P S is the measurable one. One thing new is, uh, let me go back a little bit. The signal, the control signal. Here, U sub FB, feedback control signal. The signal here is also considered as measurable, always, because you are using digital control. So you can use this control, uh, control signal, OK? So I, here, we are using a time domain scheme. So I want to make use of this existing knowledge about what I, what I can use. That is U feedback signal plus the measurement of PES, which means the PES is measurable, and this one is also considered as measurable. So how, I, how can I do? So here is the, g let's say we have an idea of learning operator. So this time, my table, compensating table is this. I want to base it on previous table plus previous um, uh, PES, previous control signal. How can I um, update my, obtain my current table? So a simpler form will be doing it this way, to this type of iteration. But what is the ideal form of this L? If we, yeah, L can be nonlinear, but it's hard to consider. So let's see. Um, this is linear operator here. Then I keep iterating. Then finally, I can get something like this. So clearly, the learning rate will be like this. The ideal learning law will be 1 plus PC. Be careful, I don't know the P exactly. We have uncertainties in the P. So, so we know that the learning operator will be somehow like very high gain in a low frequency, a low gain like this. So this is the learning operator for the disk drive. Yeah. So what I did is to make use of uh, learning control, uh, make use of this uh, feedback signal, and using the PES signal plus uh, the feedback signal times my nominal plant. Here I just simply take this nominal, nominal plant as a double integrator, put together, then go through updating law. Then I form my ZEP table, called uh, compensation table. <coughs> so this is the in block diagram. Let's show you in math. I know you, you know the math equation better than the block diagram. 
um, what I did is um, actually is uh, originally is L. Originally is L. P S, but I split this L because L is. L is 1 plus PC times PS, while PS times C is my control signal, control output signal. So this one will be PS times P times UFB. So I have measurement of this and measurement of this. Then I have a nominal plan for the P. So that's why I split this one. This is my L. This is my L. So I put the L PS feedback signal nominal plant. This is a ZPF. I guess you can uh, you can <laughs> figure out. Oh, this is zero phase filter with some um, iteration variant cutoff plus iteration variant learning gain. So in total, this is my this is my learning operator. So the learning operator is kind of scheduled from iteration to iteration. So that's why I use scheduled parameters. So at that time, I was thinking how to speed up learning process with minimum possible revolutions of measurements so that I can reduce the time. So it's somehow like minimum time learning, con iterative learning control. So I think what kind of tuning, knob, tuning knobs I have. I'm going to show you the tuning knobs, but I think this is standard for all of you. Uh, how can I see the learning convergence? So essentially, you want to make sure that your learning, the row will be less than one for all the omega. Um, so you can see that eventually your uh, the table will converge approximately to the DW. <laughs> this is the written in. This is the written in um, induced RO, repeat uh, run nows. So this DW, let's review this picture again. So I have a DW, I have a DN. DN is an NRO, it's random. DW is due to the track writer server track writer. So this is due to the written error. I want to compensate basically for this one. This is the repeat of and deterministic. This is a random. There is an implicit assumption here you need to be careful, which means I can average this D sub n. I can average this D sub n. So you need to average this one. So this is approximation. That's why approximation here. So I assume you can average this D sub n. So that's why you have minus dw approximate here. So you, you should not expect zero um, error because of this behavior of the random noise, uh, this term. So <coughs> that's why usually you should not expect zero error. So here are my tuning knobs. Um, I, I, learned the cut, uh, I learned the phase advance cutoff frequency of zero phase field or these type of things from um, Professor Longman's work. I can play with this learning game, but there is a one new thing I can play. Because the controller, I can, I can, the C, I can play with it. When I collect data, I can lose my, I can lose um, my bandwidth so that the error can be more significant so that I can collect. So the bad guys show up more significantly. So I can play with the server loop game. That is another new point, I guess, never seen in the literature. So so I have four tuning knobs, learning gain, cutoff frequency, phase advance, server loop gains. So my objective is to make the learning process robust and improve the learning perf performance and reduce the learning cost, which means I want uh, as few as possible uh, revolutions to do the job. So here again, I, s I want to schedule four parameters, learning gain, cutoff frequency of the zero phase filter, and the phase advance, server loop gain. And 
we didn't use any FFT, IFFT, very ex which is more very expensive. I use some cheap solutions, uh, it's purely time domain. So let me summarize what I what I did. Maybe we look at this equation again before I go through this um, description. So this is a previous ZAP table, previous compensating table, um, p collection of PES. This is uh, my uh, feedback signal. This is low pass filter. This is my um, learning gain. So let's see in words how I did this. So first, I lower the server loop gain and collect three revolutions of PES and UDAC signal. UDAC signal is a feedback out, feedback control output signal. Okay. When I do the averaging, I get averaged signal PES and averaged UDAC. I know I remove the train, double integrate it, then get a UDAC signal too, which means like I have I pass through the U feedback signal through my nominal model, PN, which is um, double integrated. So in this case, my ZAP table will be simply this if the initial table is zero. Then we do the zero fi pass filter for the first ZAP table. Um, then repeat this process again by, increase, uh, by increasing the server loop gain. So I get another table. So here I only used six revolution two iterations, or uh, six revolutions of PES and two iterations, okay? So that is acceptable. Let me show you, if you use many revolutions, what will happen? Before I show you this, I show you some average then performance. So I do the average over tracks from OD to ID, uh, it's outward diameter and inward diameter. And, oh, it's not important, the serial number. Yeah, because we, if we need to report any result, we must indicate which disk drive you used. They can track this one and repeat your result. So you need to tell this information. Uh, it's magic numbers to you, but to me, <laughs> it's, it's a very specific hard disk drive. Code information, you need to tell what kind of mode, what kind of code, something like that. So for case one, I used 16 revolutions and four iterations. Each iteration, I use four revolutions for average. So, so the case two is the one I target is six, re uh, six revolution, two iterations. So every iteration, I use three revolutions for average. So let's compare the results. Of course, the more ref, this is 70% um, of improvement. This is 51% of improvement. So if you put this 16 revolutions even bigger, you can get an even better result. So, but I, I learned that they said, okay, good enough is good enough. We only want 50%. So the gi giving 50%, you need to tell them how many revolutions you want. So finally, I finalized this six revolution, two iterations using gain scheduling, using the uh, zero pass filtering. But if you don't do this, what will happen? I'm going to show you some results if you don't do this scheduled parameter. So the results will not be that good. So here's um, a feeling. This is uh, my uh, repeatable runouts. This is my uh, non-repeatable runout. These are track, track numbers. So I need to show these results not only for single track. I need to show all the track. So <laughs> every day I, when I go back home, so I run the computer, scan my performance. Or I wrote some automatic code to do this. So in the morning, I get this picture. And you can see now, it's, um, this is a track number. It's in decimal. Yeah, it's uh, 18, 18,000. So this platform for me to play is an older, uh, not final product. It's older platform. It's um, not latest one. So here, the track numbers are maybe uh, just 20K, 18K, yeah for me to play because at that time the product is still under development so I'm using previous product to do this so I scan the performance this is RO versus all the tracks from OD to ID this is uh, NRO and this is uh, RO versus NRO called SNR signal to noise ratio and this is and uh, 
NR, let me see. And, uh, oh, sorry. This is a NRO, this is RRO. And this is my total RRO. This is my signal to noise ratio. But that matter, let's just look at this RRO. After compensation comes this one, the same scale, this level. And you can see the NRO get in touched, untouched. It's, it's no improvement, no worse. So everyone is happy about this. I didn't do a bad job in the NRO, why I d I'm doing a very good job in NRO, and it's very significant. Now come to the point, why don't we use more revolutions? Because I measure the timing. I collect, this is, I collect one revolution of the, of the, of the PES, I do the computation. So finally, from here to here, the time I consume in total is uh, 151 millisecond. Consider at that time I used 18K, uh, 18K TPI, then how many hours I need, I need to use is about three hours. For my, for my uh, scheme, six revolution, two iterations. Yeah, think about this. If you use 60 revolutions, you will put this another zero here. So in a production line, you need to ask the workers to wait 30 hours or just three hours. That makes <coughs> difference, right? So you should not, you should stop at good enough. You should not always asking for better, okay? You should stop at a point, say, oh, good enough. So the goal here is 50% um, RO improvement and 20% RO improvement. What defines the good enough? Like where, yeah, that, why, that why is 50% good enough? Yeah, they have a TMR budget team. They tell us the magic number. They have many, many, many sources of errors. They need to divide, say, oh, silver guys, you need to make sure this one will be less than something. And then it's OK. <laughs> so. No, in average sense, yeah, in average, yeah. yeah. The, of course, they, when they gave us the number, yeah, but you need to use six hours, yeah. Yeah. No, they said. Yeah, they compromise. They compromise the considerations. Like, if you do twelve. Then you need to um, spend more time to pay the workers at the production line. Consider that cost. But that's a consider. Big difference, 50 to 98 percent. Yeah, it's a if big difference. Uh, how much more density could you get when you do? No. Uh, yeah, if you put more density, then uh, the cost, the gain, you can get like ten dollars. But you need to pay twenty dollars to the workers. So do you want to do that? No. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, 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 that's terrible. That will be a disaster. <laughs> they even don't allow any real-time adaptive control in, in the disk drive. Who knows it will adapt to where? <laughs> that's the frequent they I, the question they ask. Don't use adaptive control. Who knows it will adapt to where? <laughs> so, so here is the timing estimation. So we need to do lots of things. Uh, in, a, uh, in a bigger picture to consider um, stop at some good enough stuff, yeah. So the question is, if you, oh yeah, here are some other issues. Like at that time, the hardware is not good enough. They only can do on six to uh, seven to nine die bits in the server bursts. Uh, that's a very dedicated issue. Uh, let me say in a simple way, which means the table you learned, you cannot store it in, in eight bits, you can only use Four bits or two bits to store your <laughs> to, to store your, your 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 table. So what will happen? How uh, wha how the performance will degrade? So so I need to investigate this problem. But after I finish this work uh, with some hard working, <laughs> then they told us, oh, "Don't worry, this is no longer an issue." <laughs> 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 so I feel so <laughs> angry about this. So in industries like that. So, but I did, I put this table here to show you that the quantization of the table will may give you some performance degree and degradation, so you can see. So without quantization, 
is 51, but with uh, quantization level 4, you only have four counts, 0, 1, 2, 3. <laughs> you have, then in that case, you have this type of um, performance. So not very, very bad. I know three or five, no big difference. So the resolution is an issue. So maybe the, the it's due to this table they decide, due to this initial result they decide to push hard for the for the for the firmware for the chip maker to make this um, uh, embedded hardware to do a better job. So I don't know who is the cause, who is the effect, but um, this investigation is also sometimes required in the application. Now I investigated this. Um, gain, overall gain of the P, of course it's a, in, it's a double integrator times a gain. I call it a lumped gain, put everything together, there's a gain. If I, I have uh, some variations about this gain, then what is the effect of the performance? Then a plus or minus 20%, and you can see the performance will not change significantly, will not change significantly. So overall speaking, it's around 20. So I tried different ideas, like you put five revolutions, five iterations, so this should be odd, uh, which means I don't do any uh, re uh, uh, averaging, don't do any averaging, but I used the gain scheduling and a zero pass filter. So this performance, um, um, okay, acceptable, but not very impressive. Remember, I can achieve using uh, uh, two iterations uh, more than 50%. So which means you can see you can see that yeah I have a different learning gain scheduling faster learning convergence if I use a constant learning gain I have this but I used 20 revolutions if I do to that do some uh, scheduling I can do a similar job okay similar job but I use significantly less revolutions. So, which means if you do a gain scheduling, you do have some benefit. Uh, here is the ma magic part I, I want to show you with regarding the server loop gain scheduling. Also improves the learning performance. So, we increase the server loop gain from a lower value than normal. So, you can see that I can get a much better result if I do the um, server loop gain scheduling, server loop gain scheduling. But here are something, uh, lots of things I need to explain. Okay, you use a four revolution, one iteration, one only one iteration. Then you have overall improvement, like so. You need a iteration. Then you put another eight revolution, or two iterations. You have this. If you put more, you have more performance, more performance. But if you have, without zero pass filtering, you have an even worse result. Okay, even worse result. Uh, let me see. Uh, without a zero pass filtering, it's worse than this. So zero pass filtering is doing good job. It's doing good job. Um, also, we have used the learning gain scheduling. Experimentally, yeah, experimental. But there are some rules. I, I wrote a short note for for other engineers. If I'm not around, how you can do that? Some heuristics, yeah. Can you what, they, what the rules are? But so far, they didn't chase after me. After me. <laughs> no, but, uh, can you state a few rules? Oh yeah, yeah. There are some rules. You should use a larger learning gain first, then use a smaller, large, smaller learning gain later. Okay, it's consistent to all you guys observed. <laughs> not, not, nothing strange here. Yeah, but the, my advice is on the first iteration, you should not use better not use any learning gain more than 0.5. So don't be aggressive. So zero pass filtering is, is just to safeguard the learning convergence. 
learn the uh, low frequency contents of the ZAP table first. So the gain scheduling is also like that. You lower pass filter, you put your cutoff with um, higher, then you put your cutoff lower, something like that. You learn the, uh, learn, you learn the low frequency uh, contents first. So the benefits from scheduled parameters, um, the benefits of these are the, the alpha one and alpha two is the server gain. I try to, I, I lower my server gain, the first iteration, second iteration. So basically I only want to use two iterations, okay. So first time I put minus three, then minus two, I can get better result. If I even uh, uh, losing my bandwidth, then it's minus five, then minus three, I can get even better one, even better one. So this one is actually want to indicate that the scheduling of the server bandwidth will be helpful, will be helpful. Show you some results. So this is the one. Maybe many of you saw this. The before the zap, this arrow is something like this. After one is like red one, so it's pretty smaller. Don't expect this is a straight line. <laughs> it cannot be like that. But if you only use this picture, you cannot convince anyone in in, in my company. So I I want to use some other ways to convince them. So I I use spectrum. Okay, this is number of tracks, number of sectors. So only the w this one is only one sample along this sectors, only this sectors. So I do this picture 3D before and after. Mm, they say uh, this is better, but this is still not enough. I want to show um, in in spectrum form, low frequency in the frequency portion here. Or this one is not sorry, this one is not. It's not spectrum. It's just 3D. Show them all. Time domain. This is a frequency domain. So you can see lots of um, peaks here after compensation is significantly smaller. Um, and also low frequency, uh, high frequency portion did not get amplified. So everyone is happy. So this is an impression in on the scope. In a moment later, I show you on the scope like this. So this is a p position error signal. This is my control signal. So you can see position error signal, you have some fix fixed shapes, okay? But after compensation, the fixed shape disappeared, and then the control signal also got smaller. If I do a typical um, spectrum, um, PS spectrum before and after, so you can see that the after compensation is always below this red one, and also you deck this control signal is also under this one. So the zap will also reduce the energy consumption if you apply this IOC. So after uh, after showing this, it's still not enough. Um, they ask me to do um, a PDF and a CDF comparison. So this is, uh, everyone knows, this is a proportional density function, okay? And this is a cumulative CDF, and this is a CDF. Uh, you can see the width of here is significantly smaller than this one. So in this way, they believe, okay, I can, s I can increase the density. So let me do a quick summary. I can increase the TPI, almost double the hard disk drive capacity. Um, or for the same TPI, you can increase the ri uh, reliability if you don't want to double this capacity. So it's a purely algorithm code change can reduce the uh, requirement for the accuracy of the um, server truck writer. So this one shows the powerfulness of the advanced control ideas. <coughs> so, but you still need to think of what kind of price you need to pay you need extra time to learn the compensation table during the factory process. So you need to do a trade-off um, between uh, good enough and better. You have to stop at some point <laughs> if you are good enough. 
Um, you need a better server demodulator chip to embed, embed this uh, learn compensation table. So it's already running in this uh, production line, uh, 58K TPI. What's next? Okay, these are the references. So this work I have I have documented this one in uh, June 4th, 99. That is um, about three months after I joined Seagate. I joined in March, and um, we need to document a lot of things, implementation results, characterizations. Um, so there are other issues. Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but privately, if you want a copy, I can send you. <laughs> I, because it's already, already, already um, got this um, grounded pattern. So there are other issues, um, oh, it's very technical. It um, needs lots of explanation. But anyway, you can see that uh, we should expect the table repeatability from track to track. By JSON track, is the ZAP table the same? We tend to believe they are the same, but in fact it's not, okay? And what if you, you embedded the ZAP table, you have learned then wh when you read back, you have some error in your table, corrupted. So how tolerant? So you need to think about multi-read, about your neighborhood. If your neighborhood are good guys, and you have one bad guy, how can you tolerate this? So you need to characterize the performance degradation. So that's, uh, I also did this one. Also, it depends on what is the um, ratio. If your RO is dominant, y you can do a good job. What if your NRO is dominant? So in that case, can you do the job? So you also need to answer these questions. Uh, should we always learn from zero, or we starting from some urgent track? But answer is generally no, no, not true, not true. We should start from zero. You should not. Should not. So what, so what do we do? We start from zero. Why? Yeah, we start from zero. I, I, I need to answer this type of question by experimental results, not from equations. <laughs> and also, what if you have dual actuator, you, how you should do that job? Uh, and what if you can, you can do the same thing for the server track writer so that your induced um, routine error is smaller? This is so technical, I, I want to skip this. <laughs> so I'm going to show you several things um, in a minute. Um, basically, I want to show you what is the PS signal look like, a survey index signal. If it's uh, not synchronized, what it will be look, uh, look like, and what is the synchronized PS. If it is synchronized, you can see the fixed shape of the PSRO, and you can see what is the learn compensating table, and I'm going to show you the magic by talking before and after, I will see. So, so let me let me show you. I I need uh, maybe a very short time. I practiced last night, and it's working, and to my surprise. <laughs> yeah, it sit sit in my shelf for three years. So, here I have an um, RS two three two port talk to my computer, let me put this one in, and I plug in the power supply of my scope. I plug in my power supply for my power supply. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you need a volunteer? No, no, no. no. <laughs> you volunteer, then my magic will not work. <laughs> Yeah, I show you my hand is empty. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to turn on my scope. I'll leave this one on. Now I turn on this power supply to supply the power of, uh, of my disk drive. So now it's loading my setting of this. 
I need to start my DOS box. There is a one called Xtalk. It's a very ancient communication program. <laughs> Probably many of you heard of it. Called Xtalk. Then I want to talk to my drive, send some commands, then they show me some data. So let me type Xtalk. This talk is kind of slow, but uh, still okay. So, so you can see there is a command T. T. If I put uh, some command, they will tell me what track I'm on. Now I'm on zero A. Let me can I can I enlarge? It? Cannot enlarge the DOS box. Good, thank you. So there are many layers of the, it's kind of uh, operational system to me. Uh, there are many layers, and uh, like in the layer four, it's dedicated for server. Some layers of the commands are dedicated for rewrite or something. So for layer four, if I see a dot command, it's uh, give you which track. I can seek to, say for example, I can, I can seek to form 4,000, track. So now if I dot it, it's 400 track. You can see some pulse is running here, but uh, I guess something, no, oops, don't leave. My, maybe I put it here. The magic still will work, I guess. So, did you... Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a kind of uh, interference. So, you can see, I can trigger on. What, which one is trigger on? Or maybe it's ground the problem. Let me see. It's ground. It's triggered. It's triggered. No, it should stop running. Uh, let me do this one later. Don't worry. So if I put the command, if if I put command P one, it will display the PS signal for me. Can you see some uh, fixed shapes? Yeah, fixed shapes. But better to look at this one in here. So let me. Did you see something on there? Yeah, <coughs> yeah I enlarged through the max, enlarged the scaling. So this guy will be a fixed, oh yeah, it's fixed shape. So it's, it's not running. <laughs> So I synchronized my PES. I synchronized my PES with the server index. This are index. So within this index, it's a one revolution. Yeah, I can change. Yeah. So you can see you can two revolutions here. Yeah, this is one revolution. This is a PS. But what if I don't synchronize? If I don't synchronize, if you see that the pulses are running, this is running. So you can see some. But this track may be too bad. Let me go to a nicer track, Seek 100. So it's nicer. So let me synchronize again. So it's a nicer, right? Nicer. So in the, in the, in the outer, outer track, so what I'm going to show you is the magic I'm going to play. Here you have some fixed shapes. Maybe the scale of this guy is too big. Or oh, interference over here. OK. Uh, I want to learn. Let me learn this. So I want to show you before. The, this is off. This is on, off, on, off. So can you see the difference? Yeah. If you can feel the difference, 
in industry, they say if you can feel the difference, the improvement is already 20%. <laughs> That's the rule of thumb. <laughs> um, so I want to show you. So this one is your, uh, this one is the, is the control signal, DAC signal. Now this is an on. Let me off it. On. Off. On. So you can see, I can toggle on and off. Now I'm going to show you the learner table. This is, now it's on, yeah. I can show you the table. This should be table, fixed shape. Yeah, this is the table I learned to compensate that is zigzag, zigzag. So, How so many bits do you need to this uh, is a full resolution. Uh -huh, full resolution. But because of the uh, storage of the pattern, you sometimes you want maybe you want to use eight bits. It um, still can keep the performance. Then you just use eight bit. I guess final resolution, final resolution is eight bit. Yeah. So that is one. So I'm going to I'm going to seek to. Uh, what's the current track? The current track is one zero one one. Let's seek to the Eugenson track. 101. You can see that if I seek to another track, let me go back to PS. The PS is still very big. If we I apply, if I apply the table I just learned from another track, you can see that no, I, now I'm on, I'm off, on, so. No difference. No difference. Yeah, probably even worse. Yeah, I observed that. Yes, sometimes maybe even worse. So which means the repeatability of the table may not be that good. May not be that good. So, so if I, if I learn at this track, you can see it's smaller. Then I off, on, off, on. Then let's check the table. Yeah, oh, the, because it's off, this on. So the table, you can see the shape is still different to the one you're, you're lear you have learned on your Jensen track. So basically, that's what I want to show. So if you want. Uh -huh. This kind of an error, which would repeat, would uh -huh. be similar from track to track. Uh -huh. So these errors, what, can you give a list of causes of the errors? This error mainly due to the, due to the server track writer routine non-perfect circle. Yeah, but now, so the, the question is why, what is it that doesn't repeat? Or is when you write in the cause of this uh, non um, ideal circle is random, which means in your server truck writer, you have r random noises cause. Yeah, they are they are writing in the different different um, irregular circles, and this irregularity is due to the server error uh, in your. Noise, noise. Nice. Not vibration. Vibration is not a big issue. They can make the environment very nice. It's noise. It's some it's random like noise. noise. Electronics, demodulator noise. Like you have different temperature, your noise will be different. Also, vibration is part of it, but uh, not not a major issue. Major issue is the intrinsic. They cannot do any better. Yeah, if there are some vibration, they can do a better job by doing some isolator mm -hmm. vibration. Yeah. They cannot improve. This is just this is. You have to compensate. Otherwise, we can ask the server truck rider, please ride a truck, be more circular. But they say, sorry, we cannot do that. You have to compensate by yourself. So that's the, that's the work. So why not we start? I have another 30 minutes. I want to share with you my some, some of my work in the repetitive control. And I don't have a demo here, but uh, I have lots of experimental results to show you. So it will be very quick. Yeah? 
Pasmuri is uh, not so many. Huh? Huh? Economic, economic. Baba, I need to project the cabin as well. Baba, I can't even do it. Yeah, throw this one away. So, here I mainly give you some of my important observations and uh, uh, practice I tried for the repetitive learning control. I mentioned that there is a one important issue ignored in many uh, publications, but if you apply it in the real thing, you will find it. So I guess I claimed, maybe I claimed too much. So the, 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 the motivation for our, uh, repetitive control is for this kind of multiple harmonics. Uh, I, I keep telling the story like Chinese acupuncture. Um, these are the needles. So the repetitive control is uh, multiple needles and uh, Chinese uh, acupuncture, so then you can <laughs> you can counteract on these peaks. So, so let's uh, look at this one. How I did this body plot, I put a sweep sign here, I do this body plot. But uh, it turns out that the, the control of body plot is easier to, is easier and cleaner to measure. I also, uh, yeah, of course I can measure the sensitivity here. I can have a peak here, dip here, but it's hard to measure accurately. So it's easier to measure controller. So you know, this is my controller body. So in my presentation here, I'm, I'm going to use controller again, a controller body. If your controller body has such kind of peak, which <coughs> means you will have a dip. You will have a dip in your sensitivity, okay? So, uh, because this is easier to, to, uh, to measure and it's cleaner, it's easy to see. If you measure the sensitivity function in a low frequency portion, it's very, very, very zigzag and noisy. So this one is a one peak. It's due to the adaptive feed forward control and to cancel the dominant um, disturbance from the spin motor run out. So this one is basically very good for a known a disturbance with a known frequency but with unknown amplitude and a phase. This is AFC. So this is a one peak here in your, in your controller body plot. So basically the multiharmonics, if you have multiharmonics you, you can use repetitive control. The basic idea is from the COM filter form and it turns out we have a nice uh, interpretation called internal mode principle. I think everyone knows this picture. Then Q is a Q filter. Okay. Oh, why this color? So in fact, if I put in the disturbance, I say here we have position dependent disturbance. We have torque level disturbance here. So. I have a controller here, I have learning gain here, I have filter here. This is my internal mode, internal model. And N is my lens of the memory buffer. Okay, so this is the picture is not hard to understand. Everyone knows. So this is a shaped internal model by Q filter. So this is G sub R is like this. We can write a transfer function from disturbance to my output, so Y divided by D sub T, because um, for the spinner model, the disturbance will come into here, torque level, not position level, okay? So spin the, the repetitive control is to cancel the torque level repetitive disturbance D sub T here. So I want to start it from the D to my Y, what the transfer function should look like. So it will look like this. If I use a sensitivity notation, S like this, 
is simply 1 minus s divided by c, okay? So my internal model here can be plugged in here like this, put into here, okay? So my output can be written as the response of my torque level disturbance and the position level disturbance in this way, while my internal model comes in here, comes in here. That derivation is not important. What I'm going to show you here is um, using small gain theorem, you can uh, get a nice proof for the repetitive control like this. I guess and this is also very easy to understand because you don't want this loop to uh, to blow up and then you put everyone uh, amplitude less than one, then you are set. So. So you can look at this uh, repetitive control uh, stability issue as an application of small gain theorem. So there's some observations. If the Q filter is set to one, it's practically impossible to satisfy the stability. Uh, so basically, Q filter is to robustify the, the, the learning process at the cost of uh, inability of rejecting higher harmonics above the cutoff frequency of this Q filter. I don't care if your frequency is higher. So, and filter H can be a zero phase filter. It's also, uh, ha it also has some important role. So it's a, a tuning knob, it's tuning knob. So the major task is de 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 in designing RLC is determine what is your filter, H here. Let me review what is H. It's in here. So, so problems. The the controller should be kept untouched. This is very important. You don't want to change the C of Z, and the N can be very big. Okay, in our disk drive applications, we are time critical. We are also memory critical because we want to keep the cost low. So. In this case, this big N give me lots of trouble. And the design of the edge is heavily dependent on the model information you have. Um, and the Q filter may introduce the peaking frequency drift from the ideal harmonics frequency. I'm going to show you in a minute later. So oh, I don't want to do advertisement here. I used for the first time, yeah, probably in 99, I'm the first one to observe this problem experimentally. Uh, so before I show you this um, drift problem, I show you the scheme I'm using. Basically, I do a time sampling, and then put this um, internal model here, this zero phase filter, then I do up something again, put to the loop. So basically, I have M, which is called degree of parsimoniousness. DOP is not department of what? Politics. <laughs> um, okay, let me show you one thing. So the this is my controller body. If I apply the repetitive control with um, Q filter, I measure the body plot, and you can see the water bed effect here. So this green one is the control body plot for EFC. You have a single peak here. Then we, you have a dip here. You have a dip here, okay? But for repetitive control, you use Q filter. You can see your peaks will die out in high frequency, but you still have several peaks working here. The peak here will reduce, attenuate your um, harmonics, but it will amplify your neighborhood frequency contents. So this is a na very natural. You have an order better effect here. All these are actually measured uh, plots, okay, on the drive I implemented. But you can see here, I, s I see the peak point here. The peaking here is different. I drift a little bit. You can see there are numbers here. I want to show you this is a drift, which means if you have a drift corresponding to your drifting frequency, your amplitude is for this frequency of disturbance is reduced significantly. So it's not as good as you, th as you thought. So it's, it's got degradation, 
due to the phase shift, uh, frequency shift, sorry. Then I did multiple harmonics. This is a number of harmonics. There's a phase harmonic, second, third harmonics. Here the harmonics is 90 hertz for the basic harmonics. So I can see the frequency drift, frequency drift in this way. Suppose there should be zero, okay? And the drift is in terms of hertz. It's quite a lot, quite a lot. And uh, for this one, red one is, uh, I didn't uh, use a degree of um, parsimonious here. I didn't do any down sampling. But if I do any down sampling, then I do a bad job, okay? Even bad. Bad. And this one I use the zero uh, zeros order hurdle, and I can see show you that if I do a first order hurdle, doesn't help. It does not help. It still drift like this. Still drift like this. So what is your so important observation is. Let me introduce you. The omega c is the cutoff frequency of your Q filter. Uh, if you increase the Q, uh, you increase the cutoff of this omega c, your frequency drift gets gets better. It's better. And there is an optimal value for this. What is the NPA? NPA is the phase phase advance. PA is phase advance number of steps. But if NPA is one, there is a big peak corresponding to optimal. Uh, omega C. Uh, let me see what is okay. This when MPA is one, this is, a, this is a good news. When MPA is set to two or three, is at the boundary. Let me show you this picture maybe better. Mm. Okay, let me see. I need an equation. Okay, uh, let me return to this one. So, how can I assess the frequency drift? Uh, whether it's good, or is, is better or worse? So I use the energy of the peak, energy of the peak. So I put them together. I show you this is the peak. I have a performance index here. So I can s I investigate the, uh, the, the MPA, the phase advance, and the cutoff frequency of the Q filter. So there, there are some correlations between this MPA and uh, and, and uh, uh, the phase advance and the cutoff. So which means only when this MPA is one, uh, sorry, positive, this black one with with circle. And only when phase advance is one, the peak can be very big. The energy, I mean, all your peaks are aligned very well very well. So which means the Q filter design cannot be arbitrary. Oh, I want this one 100 hertz. No, it's, you should refer to this picture. You want maximum attenuation of your, of, your, of your dips. Then you need to put your Q filter cutoff frequency in the right way. So there is an optimal one. There is an optimal one. <coughs> So here I want to show you several um, tables. So there's an optimal um, phase advance. It's found to be one. There is an optimal cutoff frequency of Q filter. So that gives you the maximum significant sensitivity attenuation. So you can see this is the best score I have. Uh, my sampling frequency is like that. So when phase advance, this number is very, very big. This number is a function of cutoff frequency of my uh, Q filter. This is a uh, number of advance, okay? I only use the first order Q filter. So I just, to sum up the peaks at the specific harmonic frequency, summarize uh, to, to, to put them together, to get a J. So this J is simply the energy of your controller peak, controller peaks. So basically I, I can find out there is an optimal, optimal 
phase of one step and optimal cutoff frequency. Okay, so uh, optimal cutoff frequency is here. Is here. It's the biggest. So if I follow this step, follow this um, optimization thinking, then I reduce this sensitivity peak. Oh, this is a controller, controller body. So you can see they got aligned perfectly. And I bet here is also aligned very good, much better than before, much better than before. So there is a magic number, magic value for the Q filter cutoff frequency. You cannot set it arbitrarily. Otherwise, you will not align correctly. Okay. So now, now this result is uh, one x. I didn't do any uh, parsimonious uh, stuff. Uh, it's authentic implementation of this. Uh, so you can see, my I, I I told you my my drive is um, forty five. Uh, uh, 5400 RPM corresponding to 90 hertz per rep, <coughs> uh, 90 hertz spinner frequency. So the 1x should be 90 hertz, so it's aligned 90 hertz exactly here. Then this one should be 180, this is 200. So this one will be 300, um, um, 270, so this is something like that. Yes, yeah, spinner frequency. I want. You don't apparently. There really aren't much in the way of harmonics. Is that right? What? What harmonics? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The we the only care about. about we only care about. We did uh, spectrum analysis. We only know that the first five harmonics will be more dominant. Yeah, but how come they don't First of four to five, <laughs> so it's uh, pretty small for the higher higher order harmonics. High harmonics, so pretty small. The first one is the yeah, the first one is big. Yeah, probably they only do s uh, they only do one in the in the older drives. Later they believe maybe we need to do three. Later they believe um, maybe two will be enough. So it's keep changing depends on the spectrum your energy. Yeah. What's the form of your Q filter? It's the first order low pass, but worse. This is first order, low pass. But you could have been using zero phase. Uh, oh, yeah, I put, a f I put all the zero phase to H. There's another H. H is simply do averaging in my case. Yeah, but, but if, it, if your Q filter was zero phase, you wouldn't have the alignment problem, would you? You wouldn't have the. Q filter in in my implementation in real time, it's hard it's hard to do the z real uh, zero phase for the internal mode. At current point, let me see. Yeah, this is a good point. If I remove the Q, it's okay. Use, uh, for the Q, you use the spin filter, that linear phase shift can be modeled by uh, Mm -hmm. If you remove the delay from your Q delay, you could actually have isometry with a zero phase low pass. I do have a zero phase low pass filter there, but you still need another uh, uh, low pass filter, which is has to be a causal. Let me see. Yeah, if you use a circular buffer, that might be possible. It might be possible to use your, your non 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 causal filter uh, if you use circular buffer. In my Im implementation, I I cannot do the non causal for for the buffer arranged for me. I cannot ask uh, arbitrary buffer from from other groups. Let me see. Yeah, in fact, in fact, both the filter can be a zero phase, can be non-causal, okay? 
But even zero phase or non or even use a non causal filter, the phase drift problem is still there. It's still there. I remember it's still there. I only used a uh, phase fi uh, filtering of zero phase to the averaging. This is still there. Yeah, I I remember I played it with that. So that's why I still put a zero phase filter there. I still need this cube. Let me see that if I use the optimal uh, Q cutoff of the Q filter, they can see that the 2x posimonials still do doing a very good job. But if you see this one, why this one is uh, smaller than this one? It's due to the scaling problem of the plot. So, so you can see this is a uh, 2x. They can still do the job. Um, Okay, let's say 4x, then your DOP, degree of parsimonious, is a little bit different. So you have uh, some performance degradation here. Okay? Okay. I'm going to show you there is uh, one thing. I can, this 8x, so this one is too bad. So not very good. So I show you some time domain traces using inject sign. So this is um, this is uh, your I I did some inject sign. So it's uh, in my position error. I have um, 90 hertz disturbance here. After apply the mm, at this point, this is the point I apply the uh, repetitive control. This is my control signal. Compensation signal. This is error goes to zero. You see, so one x is like this. Then two x seems the two x seems they go faster to zero, and four x the transient is much better. Seems these are time domain traces. For ninety hertz, you got impression like this. This is this um, this error for the first revolution. I guess. You don't. Know, you you are zero. Everything is zero. So eventually, you build up your control signal. So you need at least one, at least two revolutions to build up for your transients. So here, stay here is cancel canceled out like this way. But you can see the transients. If you count from here to here, you for eight one hundred eighty hertz two x harmonics you spend more time to settle than 1x and if you see this 270 you spend even longer to settle so it's harder and harder for higher harmonics to settle it takes longer transient period so this is a 2x this is a 4x and you can see even they have um, they cannot eliminate them totally have some residue So it's clear that the transient performance gets worse as the frequency gets higher. When frequency is high, 4x is worse than 2x we observed. But for uh, frequency is low, the difference is not big. But for 1x harmonic, a uh, 1x DOP, degree of parsimonious, the IOC gain is limited. The domain of the stability is small, smaller, but if you use a 4x or 2x a DOP, the gain can be increased, which means the um, the parsimonious scheme may enlarge, will enlarge the stability region, using less memory, while use less CPU budget. This is my observation. I did some measurements about this uh, stability region. Seems that if you down sample, your stability region is getting bigger. Okay, I can add additional phase advance in my position error signal. So here I is a benchmark. I use no phase advance in the PES f signal, but I have overall phase advance. Of course, it's one step. Um, if I add an additional phase advance here, you can see 
this is no, this is yes. Did you see some difference? Here get rounded. This rounded. I put more is something like this. This is all bad, I guess, still. If I put even more, oh, it's like this. So it's uh, this no, no peak here, but they have peak here. I put more, then there is a peak in here. So you can see the, um, these are all the measured experimental data. You can see the water better effect. So I put together with two, phase ones for the additional PS is two, is in red, green is no, we don't have, it's like this. So you can see the peak is the same, but the here the transit band behavior here is different. But if I put a four <laughs> compared with no, it's somehow like the mirror. Uh, this is a um, red one is a um, four step advance. So, and this green one is no, uh, it's no face advance. So you can see uh, this is um, very fun to play. Give you an impression of the um, impression of the water bed effect in the repetitive control. Okay. Okay. So finally, I actually I did something called a uh, disturbance observer. So this um, this this one is um, my nominal control body. Then eventually, plus together, I can make a body plot like this, which means I have a more attenuating low frequency while I put some uh, peaks here. So it's actually a calm. It's actually a calm, right? It's a calm. It's a sp calm, like calm filter. So my 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 manager told me, oh. This is the beautiful, <laughs> most beautiful controller body I've ever seen. So this is the uh, his dream. He wanted this type of controller. Uh, I'm going to show you some something people in a repetitive control they, they didn't try this probably, but I I remember Professor Longman has something in this. Uh, actually, I played with the code. I can generate the sensitivity peaks. Uh, every 45 hertz, it's no longer the multiples of your frequ uh, fundamental frequencies. So you can still do the job. So I can I can generate the controller body plot. This is 45 hertz. This is 90 hertz. So I can still do this type of trick. Right. So you played with this one before, I remember. <laughs> so. This is uh, still um, half of the fundamental frequency, 90 hertz. But what if you have something totally different? I still can do it. I do uh, 150 hertz. This is uh, my 300, uh, 300 hertz, and uh, even 100 hertz. It's no longer multiples or even divided by two something. So, arbitrary fundamental frequency. That answers the possibility of a repetitive control to cancel. Um, Periodic, periodic disturbance, but the period may not be multiples of your uh, buffer, of your capital T, <laughs> right? So anything periodic can be handled. In fact, what I'm trying to say it in this way. So I just did some experimental result to convince you. So if you have multi multiple harmonics like this, don't worry, we have, we have the calm. <laughs> like calm, or we can calm it out. So I have, fi I have some final remarks about this. Uh, so repetitive control is very powerful idea in rejecting the periodic disturbance. Uh, it is a special application of calm filter. I would like to say the IOC is a special case of IOC, probably is vice versa. Because um, you have a resetting in the initial states. So and repetitive control must obey the order bed effect, while iterative learning control may not due to the resetting operation. 
But IOC must obey the world, world better effect in iteration domain. This is my belief. So, so what about, I don't have anything periodic, but I only have a selective multi-frequency notch. I want to notch them out. So we have something called uh, active damping technology uh, for handling multiple resonance frequencies in disk drives. Um, and this is uh, a very uh, rough thinking about what is the research in the IOC. I think it's very rough. So I guess learning control here, IOC, ROC is relatively matured, and it is inherently robust, less model, ba less model based, and tolerate to slight nonlinearities. And transient and monotonic issues are not well handled until today, I think is not widely appreciated. In practice, the monotonic issue is the key issue. And I, I believe application of IOC to PDE systems is also not well understood, which is an infinite dimensional system. And some of the intelligent material materials exhibit some fractional order dynamics, like you have polymer, you have piezo, you have silicon gills. This type of materials um, uh, structures, if we want to control it, um, is still not well understood using IOC, how this one will work, and also design issues. For nonlinear scale, large scale spatial temporal interconnected system, how we should apply IOC it will be interesting. <laughs> and still, there is an intrinsic belief that. A nonlinear updating law probably can do a much better job, um, even for linear system. But um, the, uh, like the LKR, you know that the optimal one is a um, time invariant um, proportion of feedback, state feedback. So this um, this wonder, nonlinear updating law, may not be really necessary. Probably it's just a redundant. Or, uh, you may not get real benefit from it. We need a motivation for that. Okay. So I have three granted. I talked the one thing repeated run out compensation using iterative learning control is scheduled parameters, which means something a uh, change with iteration. But as uh, Yari yesterday talked, we actually can use something uh, very in uh, with respect to both time and both iteration. So why not we think about, borrow the shaping idea, loop shaping idea to talk about um, the IOC sh the shaping design technique for T and a K domain, so 2D domain. Actually, I saw some papers are talking about two, 2D shaping. I think we can borrow the ideas in IOC. And these are the published applications, and this is the one I mentioned to you about multiple resonance frequency using active damping. So in this case, it's selective notch, selective notch. But that kind of notch is different to the conventional notch because we essentially use a fit four idea called active damping. And I shared with you some of my um, experiments with this parsimonious repetitive control. Um, Professor Longman pointed out that why not, why not use a Q as a zero phase filter? I will double check that. I'm pretty sure that there's a reason we have to do that in my application. <coughs> Otherwise, I all the way use zero phase filter and then I don't have anything to worry. Um, yeah, I need to check with that. So thank you for your time and patience. That's all I have.